I actually discovered Benzo Buddies the day before I went into the rehab, and I sort of made a little intro thing, and I was like, hey, I'm having a really hard time getting off of this. And I remember what just one person commented and was like, do not go to rehab, but I didn't listen to them. I went into rehab and immediately they took me off of the 0.25 Klonopin. They put me on mirtazapine for Panelog, Gabapet and Seroquel, I think it was 100 milligrams. I opted out of taking that after about five days, luckily. I remember waking up on the seventh day, I felt like I could feel every layer of the floor beneath my feet. Whenever I was eating, I could like feel the food going down. It was really hard to eat because of that. My OCD was just terrible. Hi, I'm Dr. Yosef with During. It's my pleasure to be joined by Elena, who is actually a patient of mine. We've known each other for 18 months and I've had the privilege of being able to help her uh, with uh, protracted benzodiazepine withdrawal. And I think she's got a perspective that I don't see enough on the channel, which is that of someone in their 20s going through it and the impact that it can have in your life at this age. And so she kindly agreed to uh, come on the show and talk about her experience. So thank you so much. You're so welcome. And yeah, no, it's definitely um, super crazy to just have just gotten into the workforce where you want to be and be planning a life and then literally get it stopped out of nowhere. It's I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but if this interview can help other people that have to go through that, I that would make it all worth it, honestly. Yeah. And they're out there because I see them as well. I see I see teenagers with protracted benzodiazepine withdrawal, which can probably be crazy. Uh, we, we helped yeah. someone, I think he was 17 um, last year. But um, so, yeah, let's jump right into it then. And, and we'll start at the beginning where these always start. Just... Take us back. How did you end up on benzos or psych meds in the beginning? What went, how did that all come about? Um, well, basically, my first introduction with psych meds was whenever I was 15, actually. Um, I got heavily into street drugs around 14, and I ended up having a really bad trip on a psychedelic. And I ended up in the psych ward and I got put on mirtazapine and propanolol. And that actually calmed the anxiety that I had super well from that whole experience. Um, and sort of, sort of honestly, even me out. Um, it did make me really depressed and tired though, which I know is pretty common with mirtazapine. But other than that, I really didn't have any issues. I just got off of it in nine months. I cold turkey both of them. And yeah, I kind of started living my life again. I was completely sober for a while. Um, and then whenever I was about 18, I don't know what made me want to do this, but I tried to trip again, take psychedelics again. And it ended up going really bad again. And I got HPPD that time pretty badly, um, which affected my vision and still kind of does, but it's a lot better now. But um, they put me on Klonopin and two milligrams of Klonopin right off the bat and 40 milligrams of Celexa right off the bat for that. I actually got prescribed the Celexa in a MedExpress, which is like an in and out medical, um, hmm. like one of those emergency um, in and out places. Um, they put me on 10 milligrams of Celexa. And then once I got into an actual psych, they bumped it to 40. But the Klonopin was really the only thing that was helping the anxiety I was having from my vision being messed up. And I've talked to other people who have gotten on Klonopin for that. I guess it's like the number one treatment for it. Um, 
But as you'll see, it sucks because once you get off the Klonopin, not only can you be dealing with withdrawal, but the HPPD will kind of rebound as well. Um, so I can talk about that a little too. But just just quickly for for the people out there that may not know what HPPD is, could you just describe just briefly what 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 that condition is and and what you experience from it? Yeah, so it's hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder, and basically it can be different for everybody. Um, it can be accompanied by severe anxiety, like that's what happened to me. But basically, you're you can see after images halos. Um, there's a common misconception. It's like you're still tripping. It's really not like that. It's just almost like there's like something connected in the brain where it shouldn't have to do with your eyesight. Um, mine's really bad with visual snow, especially when I go outside and I'll see like, like things will look super detailed to me. So it's almost like your vision enhances, but in an overstimulating sort of way. Um, but I mean, if anybody mm -hmm. out there is dealing with that, sunglasses are literally a lifesaver and just time, like it started not bothering me as much with time. I mean, I don't even notice it now, but um, yeah, so that's why I got put on the um, prescription medications and my doctor had never had any plan of taking me off of them and I was actually doing great on them, which is a story that I don't hear much, but I, I just flourished on the medication. Like I always had crippling anxiety, so the clonopin really helped me. I didn't feel like an urge to use other drugs anymore because of that. I, I just felt okay inside. Um, I, you know, I, I got married. I, I went, got my education, got my dream job, everything like that. So it wasn't until oh, about three years ago now is whenever I decided to get off. And that was only because I wanted to have a baby. Um, but otherwise, my doctor and me probably would have just never got me off. It's honestly insane. Like I got put on these at 18 and just, uh, I don't know. But <laughs> anyways, um, yeah. Do you want me to get yeah. into, Yeah. I think so. Yeah. To talk us through, uh, so you decide that you want to have a baby. What happened next? Yeah. So I told my doctor about it. He told me just to cold turkey, the two milligrams and that for some reason he did tell me I had to step Celexa down, but he said the Klonopin I could just stop. Um, and I kind of knew not to do that just because I had been around people that abused benzos in the past and like, um, just from talking with my dad who gave me some advice and stuff. So I actually about, I want to say like every three months, I was just taking the Klonopin down 0.25 milligrams and the Celexa we just didn't touch for a long time. So I did really good with that for like a year or so. I got the clonopin down to 0.5 and then I got put on birth control. This was the hoy back in 2022 or 21. Um, I got put on birth control and went down to 0.5 milligrams and I started having like extreme terror. I started not being able to sleep, like just super heightened anxiety, um, really depressed. I just, I like my stomach was so messed up. I, I didn't know why because you'll notice a pattern. I sort of had delayed withdrawals every time I would cut down. So this didn't actually start for about 50 days after I cut my dose. And, um, yeah, I didn't connect the two, but I did raise my clonopin again to 0.75 and I evened out. I stayed there about a year and then my dad died and I felt really motivated afterwards to get the rest of the way off because he always had issues with drug use and I just felt like he that's like what he would have wanted me to do and I just wanted to like do that just like for respect for him basically I don't know but um so 
And about three months after that, I got down to 0.25 milligrams. And I should add, though, um, once I got to 0.5, my very first ever symptom was my heart started getting super tight and squeezing and feeling really heavy. And so I actually had an echo done um, and a stress test and there was nothing wrong, but I couldn't get comfortable whenever I laid down. And um, that sort of still persists sometimes to this, sometime to this day, but I, I could never put any of that together, like I said, because it was always delayed. So again, just out of nowhere, about 45 days after I hit 0.25 milligrams, I woke up Christmas Day in a massive panic attack. And from then on, I could not relax again until just recently. Um, so it, it was like everything exploded overnight in a way. Um, I couldn't eat anymore. I couldn't sleep anymore. I was having crazy OCD about religion. Like it, it, it just wouldn't stop. That was one of my main OCD things throughout this. Um, but yeah, I, I just thought I was going crazy in a way. Um, cause it was so delayed and I thought it was me. Like, I thought I was just that anxious underneath the benzos. You know what I mean? Because it didn't seem like withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So I talked to my husband and we decided that I would go to a rehab since I was having so much trouble getting off. And funny enough, I actually discovered Benzo Buddies the day before I went into the rehab. And I sort of made a little intro thing. And mm -hmm. I was like, hey, I'm having a really hard time getting off of this. But that was the extent of it. And I remember what just one person commented and was like, do not go to rehab. But mm -hmm. I didn't listen to them because I, I don't know. It was just like I had to make the decision the next day. And mm -hmm. I was like, I hadn't even read into Benzo Buddies at all. You know, I just made the post. So I was like, oh, it'll just be hard, but I can do it, you know. <laughs> um, anyways, so. I went into rehab and immediately they took me off of the 0.25 Klonopin and kind of laughed at me, honestly, that I had to go in for that much of an amount. Um, and I think they thought I was crazy. They, they put me on mirtazapine 15 milligrams, um, perpanolol 20 milligrams, three times a day, and gabapentin 900 milligrams. And then they also put me on Seroquel. I think it was 100 milligrams, but I only took that about five days. And I knew from my dad, um, you could get TD from antipsychotics. So I opted out of taking that after about five days, luckily. Um, but yeah, no, it honestly, it, it was all right there the first seven days, but then... It was nothing really got worse, I should say. But then I remember waking up on the seventh day and it was like I was just in an acid trip. Like everything looked super crazy. I felt like the floor below me, like I felt like I could feel every layer of the floor beneath my feet, like down to the earth. Like, I, I don't know, like whenever I was eating, I could like feel the food going down and like I just thought about where it was and I, it was really hard to eat because of that. And my OCD was just terrible. And I have a little bit of pre, pre existing OCD, but it, it is not this bad. Um, it was just, yeah, I, I started getting really agitated. I felt this is whenever, um, and I, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to trigger anybody whenever I say this, but maybe somebody can relate, but like, my, my two biggest OCD agitated thoughts that started there and lasted for a while was one, I just had this crazy compulsion to hit my head into glass, which I never did luckily either of these. But two, I had a really bad compulsion to put something really sharp through my stomach. <laughs> um, and that's whenever both of those started. Um, it was all mental symptoms and I remember I was at two noticeable, uh, notable stories from the rehab was one, 
we were doing like a psychotherapy where we all played a part and like acted stuff out. I don't know. It was really weird, but I had to be a part in it and I couldn't even talk. And like I was getting yelled at by my therapist for not saying my lines, but I could not get words to come out of my mouth. And I also like whenever we had our phones, I couldn't, even use my phone to pay the bill. Like nothing made sense to me. I was like afraid of everything. Um, I literally just had to be there like drawing in a notebook like this, like all day to not lose my mind. It was, it was crazy. But um, another thing that really stands out to me now that I feel like I should include looking back and it's really sad, but there was a woman who was in there with me and she couldn't stop like pacing and rocking and just like doing stuff with her hands. You know what I mean? Um, and the therapists were like yelling at her that she needed to sit still and that she needs to learn how to not do that and like all this stuff. But looking back, like I'm sure that lady had akathisia and it's just, it, it's just every time I think back to that, it makes me so sad, but mm -hmm. Anyways, um, yeah, so towards the end of my visit there, I got really paranoid about the gabapentin because I was like, I knew it was sort of similar to a benzo, um, but I didn't know how because I couldn't look anything up. So like the last three days there, I just started sticking my gabapentin down the shower drain because I didn't want to take it. And um I started getting even more, like, I think that was one of the things that spiked up my agitation and restlessness even more. Um, and then I actually left early. I left three days early because I was so sick. I they All they want you to do in rehab is go from meeting to meeting and just, like, do activities all day and I couldn't even walk down to the lunchroom like I, I was so sick I wasn't even eating I was just like laying in my bed but also not laying in my bed because I couldn't keep still like just flopping around so I just I like got my husband to pick me up I came home and I was super happy to see him but something just wasn't just really wasn't right like it felt like my home was just unrecognizable and like I felt no connection to my dogs who I love. Like I just had the worst DPDR ever, especially in those really early days. Um, and it, it was just, it was so terrible trying to readjust. And I was, I was so depressed and anxious and just still having these repetitive thoughts. Um, I actually went back to work uh, four hours a day for about a month. And then um, I had to leave again, actually, because I about, I want to say three weeks after I got home, I got a new site. And she said that my restlessness could be from the antidepressants. So I cut my Remeron from 15 milligrams to set or to 10.5. And then my, I don't know if this was related or it was just my infamous delayed withdrawals, but my akathisia, like that's whenever it really came on and the rest is just really bumped up from just like a little like restless and agitated to like urgent, I'm desperate. I need like I need something and I don't know what it is. I'm jumping out of my skin. Um, so I had to leave work again because a four hour day was taking me like eight hours to complete. I started smoking cigarettes again. I, I was just like totally manic with not being manic. You know, it was just I was so restless. And so at this point, you know, I had gotten back on to forums and seeing what what was up with all this stuff so I decided to make a trip the Hoy to Virginia to go to this doctor who said that she knew about getting off benzos and I wanted to reinstate to try to get rid of the akathisia 
And so I took all the last little bit of money that I had and went to Virginia. She put me on 15 milligrams of Valium and about the restlessness, she just said, well, you have, you're going to have to find a hobby and find something to distract yourself. And I'm inside, I'm just like dying. And I'm like, I can't do anything but like cry and rock back and forth. Like this lady doesn't get it. But anyways, I came back home and well, I should say while I was there too, I had to stay in this hotel with like a balcony overlooking the ocean. And again, I, I, I'm not trying to say this to trigger anybody. The story actually has a pretty good ending right now, but, um, uh, I, I just remember like just, just contemplating all night. I mean, I was just having suicidal thoughts every day, all day. And I, I just like wanted to jump off that balcony so bad. And I felt so out of my mind. And I just like, that's probably one of the lowest points of this whole story. And I just, um, yeah, I I was so desperate. I, I wanted to cling on to anything. So I decided to get back on this volume and it actually helped a bit for about three weeks. And in that time, the plan was I was going to use Valium to get off the antidepressants, which I know sounds crazy, but a lot of doctors seem to do that whenever either starting or stopping antidepressants. So that was part of the plan. I got the mirtazapine down to seven point. I mean, sorry, I took the mirtazapine the whole way down to zero and I took the Alexa down from 40 to 10. Um, and then the Benzos kind of stopped blocking anything after about three weeks. And I got even worse somehow. Um, this is whenever a lot of my physical symptoms started. I got really achy, um, really itchy, really like, just like, malaise all over my whole body um my head pressure got bad this is whenever I started getting like the pressure in my stomach and in my spine which I hear a lot of people talking about like just that exploding tension um yeah so I (laughs) I didn't know what to do I reinstated the mirtazapine because I just was manically doing things at that point out of desperation um and yeah and then that's whenever I finally got in touch with Yosef and from that point on it gets considerably smoother I mean I I wasn't just manically trying things and putting stuff up and down anymore um but then we decided to sorry um we decided to micro taper the benzo, so we switched to Klonopin first since that was my original benzo. And in the process of switching the fart to a liquid, um Klonopin. Oh, I remember yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> the pharmacy and this was completely on the pharmacy, they gave me a solution for point zero nine milligrams instead of 0.9 milligrams so i essentially got cold turkeyed and i have to throw this in here too actually um a couple months before that i actually started living with my mom because like i was literally infantile like i could not do anything for myself and i needed to be watched all the time so i didn't hurt myself because deep down i didn't want to. I just was suffering so bad. Um, but anyways, um, so yeah, I was staying with my moms and we were like going crazy trying to figure out why I got even worse again. And I was like, man, this feels like a benzo withdrawal again, like on top of like my akathisia and everything else. Like, I'm like, I feel like I'm withdrawing again. So we actually went out and we got a, um, a drug test thing to drug test the medication because we thought they gave me the wrong medication. And of course that still came up benzos, but 
about three weeks after that drop, I, I met back up with Yosef and a meet and, um, an appointment. And he told me how I should have been measuring my vial and they wrote it down wrong on my prescription. And I think you actually wanted me to have pills instead of the liquid even, but they just, they just messed the whole order up. I don't, I'm, this has happened before, but I, I, maybe this was with your case. I remember you, I remember looking at the bottle with you or I said something like, send me a photo of the bottle and then kind of my draw, like dropping all the way to the floor. And I said, they've, you know, they've filled the prescription incorrectly. They, they put another decimal place in there. And then we had to have the difficult conversation of, well, what do we do now? You know, because essentially you just dropped 90% of your dose and you'd been sitting there for three whole weeks. Um, Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, tell tell us about that time. You know, what was what was that like for you when you figured that had happened? Oh my god! I mean, I definitely have heard people describe it that there's two types of withdrawals. There's like a very down, depressed one, and there's like a very overexcited, almost like manic one. And I definitely have had the manic one. Like I was just sort of. And I'm usually a very laid back person, but I was just kind of running around saying I wanted to hurt myself, like just thoughts coming a thousand miles an hour. I mean, I was barely even able to have a conversation with my husband or my mom, really, that was saying. And um, he, he, I mean, they both were my two rocks, but I had to like split up time in between them just because, I mean, it had to have been so hard to take care of somebody that was like me because I was just like so restless that like I just like was clawing my skin and like just rocking, like I said. And oh, I don't even like to think about that time. But um, yeah, it, it was, it was, um, it was like I said this in, the other day, but it was like a, um, like a circular hell. Like it was just like the same hell every day. Um, I, I remember I'd wake up at like 8 a.m. right on the dot every single day and just have to like scream into my pillow and like rock back and forth for like until 12 p.m. And then I'd wow. calm down just a little bit and then, you know, it would start up again maybe like a few hours later and, it, it was really about, I mean, I, I want to throw this out here too. Like this whole thing really is just about passing time and going through the grieving process. And I feel like I was able to somewhere in there, maybe like a few months after the second withdrawal, get like really tough mentally and just be like, okay, I'm going to do this no matter what. I've made it this far. If I was going to give up, it would have been in the beginning, um, which I did try a few times, but didn't work. I'm still here. We're going to keep going. Um, Nicole told me something really great. Um, She said, you just have to live longer than this lasts. And that was kind of my mantra going through it. Um, and yeah, I just, I just started instead of looking at this as this big unfortunate thing that happened to me and poor me and just planning out like how I'm gonna not make it through this. Like it became more of just a game of passing time and trying to stay as calm as possible. Because what I also learned was whenever I'm feeding into like the terror and the restlessness, it makes it worse. Whereas if I can just hunker down and be really, I I know you can't like calm down, but if you can just be as calm as possible, it, it will almost like not escalate things like just losing your mind will and reading stuff online. That was another big thing that helped me. I just found like two or three friends that I felt really close to in this. And I just talked to them. I wouldn't get on the forums at all. I didn't, I wasn't interested any anymore. And, you know, I'm five years off and getting worse stories. They were just, I mean, God bless those people, but it was just making me worse to read that. Um, so yeah, there was just, there was, it was a very bad time, 
but at the same time, um, there, I'll just say like, there is an innate survival instinct inside of all of us. And even if like 99% of you is just losing it and like going nuts and doesn't think you're going to make it and doesn't want to make it, there's always 1% of you that does and that will get you there. And if you can just kind of latch on to that instinct, like that, like, purest part of you for lack of a better word like it's always in there and you can always utilize that so that's sort of what i did and let let me jump in here for a moment because i want to close the loop for some people who might have been worried about what happened after the pharmacy era and um essentially the the we had to make some hard choices there because it was like oh Wow, you've just you know you've dropped from I guess I'm near, pretty much a milligram of clonopin to like point one you know rather than going down a tenth of that, and so I remember meeting with you and you were saying like this last three weeks has been the worst you know it has ever been you know it's and and I'm sitting there scratching my head and we looked at that and then I remember you saying but I think I'm coming out of it a little bit. Because we mm-hmm. had to make the decision, like, do we updose you or, and and I hate to say it like this, but sometimes it is lose the progress of of what you've done because you had already done the the pain really for that drop and yeah, I guess what I want to say is things aren't always like you go off script when you're doing this work sometimes. Cause I know many people would say, Oh, well, if you got kind of dropped down, you should immediately go up. And I remember saying, well, it doesn't seem like this is actually worsening, worsening you anymore. It seems like you went into mm-hmm. a withdrawal that aggravated it and then it was dying down some. And so we took a risk at the time to say, well, you let's not lose the progress and let's keep on going and just see how this plays out. And maybe we can talk about that now, you know, t- tell us about how did things change for you symptom wise in the year after that, that mess up? Um, yeah. So I guess just to touch on what you said a little bit too, like I want to be upfront about something as well for maybe anybody else that was dealing with this. But whenever I got cold turkey that second time, I was having like terrible audio hallucinations, like, especially before I went to bed, but even during the day. So once those kind of got a little bit better, like you said, around whenever I met up with you again, we decided just to keep going. And another thing I want to touch on is I believe this really strongly. I feel like the nervous system injury is different than withdrawal. So I believe that my injury started last January about 14 months ago ish. And then I think that this, the second time I came off was almost just like withdraw. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Um, so yeah. Um, anyways though, after that, I actually, um, Kind of got worse before it got better. Um, it was really up and down. Um, I was really worried I, I wasn't going to be able to get through it. But that happened in July. And I want to say around November, I actually started to get some really nice windows for the first time in almost a year. And I started to have the acathesia drop off a bit. Um, I still wasn't able to relax, but I could, you know actually talk with my husband and have a meaningful conversation and I could feel close to my dogs and calm down enough to pet them. And, you know, I could, um, focus a little more on things. I remember being super happy. I could play video games again. Um, I started getting a little back into my, you know, laid back hobbies. Um, and I get, I guess I should mention too, actually, Right after that second cold turkey, I had to go back to work because we got like super in debt and it just like we were about to lose everything. Like I, I literally had to. And I've had people say like, Oh, you must not have been that bad if you were working. Like, 
No, I, I don't know how I did that. I was literally, again, taking like 10 hours to do a four hour shift. Like, it, but um, yeah. So anyways, back to when I started feeling a bit better, Um, I was working again. Like I said, I was able to do the work day more efficiently, like four hours and five hours instead of like 10. Um, I just feel I'm more like myself again. And then I know that's just recent, but over the past five months, I've slowly gotten almost my whole self back mentally. Like I never thought I would, but I, I just, I still have a lot of physical symptoms, but mentally I feel very good and very clear. Um, and I can relax about like 50% now. Um, like I can watch TV, but I'll have to kind of do something with my hands while I'm watching TV. Um, but it's, it's a lot better. Um, I can, I can actually like stay in this state for a while if I have to. And I have, I mean, just having the confidence that you feel like you're going to be able to get through this is a big deal. And I finally have that. And I finally feel like most of the time that I'm going to be able to get through this and heal all the way. <laughs> you mentioned there were some times where, um, I guess you, you nearly didn't make it, you know, uh, because of, you know, self harm, uh, things like that. What, what was the mindset shift that you think you needed to make to go from being in a place where, you know, it was just like, I choose death to essentially mm-hmm. I'm going to make it out of it. How did, what, how did you, go from one state to another? Well, I should first say that I really never wanted death. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate. I just wanted the suffering to stop. Um, I really never wanted to die just because I like a depressed person would like, I never thought I was like useless and people would be better off without me. I, I just, I just, was, you know, living second to second. Um, and that, that's really hard, but I, I wish I could say how people could change their mindsets to get there. But I think you have to go through the whole grieving process. And also I think you have to kind of choose positivity, which I know sounds really like new age and kind of ridiculous in this, but you almost get to a point where whenever you're feeling just a tiny bit better, or even just if you've been in this a while where you kind of learn your symptoms and you learn what will set them off and what to avoid. And it's like just choosing rather than indulging in this stuff all day, choosing to do things that are good for you and staying off the forums was a huge one. And just like choosing to, not even be like, I'm going to make it. I, you know, like not even like being like exuding positivity, but just making like little tiny decisions that are more positive for yourself. And just, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like crawling there. You kind of have to crawl to get to a better mindset. And it takes a long time usually I think, but yeah, I mean, there just comes a point where you have to choose whether you're going to lay down and die or be strong enough to take it, you know? And I think we're, I honestly think we're all strong enough to take it. Um, I just think that, man, it's the hardest thing you'll ever go through. But I mean, I've heard other people put it like, you know, like I'm not like a special person. Like I think anybody could do that. But you just, you just have to, like I said, hold on and just let the time pass. And another thing that I know not everybody has, but that I am just so grateful to have was my husband always believed me whenever I'd have like a really dark time. I remember I'd open my wallet and I have a picture of him in there and I I just look at his picture and I'd be like, Oh, I can't give up right now. Cause like, what's he going to do? You know? And even like my dogs kind of kept me going sometime, you know, it was, 
it was really just about living for other people for a while, which is kind of terrible. And it was about being selfish at the same time. Like, I think I explained it like on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I was at like the very bottom where I didn't even have like safety and comfort. So, I mean, I had to really put myself first and not care about anybody. I mean, maybe I worded that wrong, but just I had to completely just focus on myself. I couldn't care if this family member was telling me I'm faking it or this friend wasn't talking to me. I mean, I wanted to care about those people, but it was just, um, yeah, it was like, almost reforming myself from like that infantile state into where I am now again, um, which not a lot of people get the chance to do and it can be a great thing, but I would advise people to not fall into the trap of um, sort of whenever you are getting better, staying in the same patterns because I, I think that you can almost, and, and it's really easy to do, but I think that you can almost ingrain negative patterns from having to be in such a state of suffering for so long. So even if you can try to like make like a positive neuro pathway just by, I learned to crochet during all of this whenever I was freaking out laying in my bed all day. So, you know, um, I just anything positive you can do. And like I said, it doesn't have to be a big thing, even if it's just doing something with your hands. I mean, that that's just a great starting point to get out of that, like, suffering thought loop all day of obsessing uh, 24-7. And it's so hard, but it's possible, you know. So coming uh, – thank you for sharing that. When I, maybe I'll just add quickly that your journey – to greater peace with all of this is a common one that that I see where r- routinely I'll, I'll talk to people 10 years into benzodiazepine withdrawal and their husbands and their partners say, wow, they look so much better. And then I talk to the person and they go, the pain is exactly the same right now, or maybe it's a smidge better, but I'm not afraid of it is something that they'll mm-hmm. say, you know, they've kind of gone through the motions. They know what it is. It doesn't scare them in the same way. And mm-hmm. so the suffering is less and, and they're doing all of the things that you had just mentioned, Elena, like they're thinking they're trying to focus on positive things. They're trying to focus on gratitude. They've learned their limits. They know who they can see, who they can't see. And so it's this, you called it the grieving process and it is a grieving process. And it's also a process of like, Hey, what's my new normal looks look like. And then once you kind of figure out the new normal, then I guess, that that helps as well so there's yeah it's interesting that there's a way to feel a lot better during this without actually a lot of movement and symptoms just from um going through it yeah and on that point one thing i want to bring up too um is that you know like i said i am doing a lot better but i still do have some pretty significant um physical symptoms going on and Um, my mental still does pop up here and there. Um, But usually, okay, as an example, before this interview, whenever I had to think back on my whole story, I almost started feeling really bad again because I was just like indulging in this stuff and like thinking about it so much. And like I said, this is so hard, but if you can take a little step away from it and not think about it all day. I I know this sounds crazy, but I, I really think that that helps you feel a little bit better because, you know, like I said, thinking back about this today and really almost being in like the PTSD of it again, um, made, made my symptoms flare up pretty bad earlier. So yeah, it, it, you, you, you just, like you said, you learn how to cope a lot better and you almost become like a really strong, strong person in a way, you know. Well, thank you for, I guess, putting yourself through what sounded like a really unpleasant afternoon to, to kind of prepare for this. I appreciate that. Um, 
gives me something to think about uh, kind of what I'm asking for everyone coming on here. So uh, it is hard, but it, it's, it's so valuable and um, appreciated. But I, I want to ask something because I realize that you have a really unique perspective. What's it like going through all of this? Like how old were you when, when the bottom really fell out? Mm-hmm. I was 24. What's it like going through this at age 24? Um, <sighs> It's really hard. I mean, I wasn't the type of person where I went out drinking and partying all the time. But, you know, I did have friends and I did have things that I did. Um, I was really into martial arts. I haven't been able to do that in over a year. Um, I was... You know, I just got my dream job like four months before this started. And luckily, I worked at a company that was kind enough to let me come back. But I mean, still, like we had no money saved up. We had no like, I guess, like um, support safety net. Uh, Nothing to really fall back on. I mean, it's super stressful. I ended up getting into a crazy amount of credit card debt. Um, and just, you know, it, it, it also, like I said, it just, I wanted to get off to be able to have a baby and me and my husband have had to put our family on hold essentially. I mean, we wanted to do that almost like two years ago now and we're still not able to. So, um, it's really hard. Um, yeah, I mean, I could see how it would be hard at any age, but um, I think that people forget. I, I know that whenever you're older, you have sort of like a lower tolerance for things and you're kind of like weaker and you might not bounce back as quick. But I think people forget that whenever you're young, like this is kind of like supposed to be the prime of your life and you're essentially missing out on that. I mean, um, it, you have to grieve that too. You, you almost just grieve like losing your whole life that you build up. Um, and you know, I don't want to say I lost my friends cause we're still friends, but I, I didn't see any of them for like over a year. It's, it's just, um, yeah, it was, it was really hard. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about the future kind of from where you are now? Um, I feel pretty hopeful about it. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I still get scared that things could get bad again because I'm not completely off of the mirtazapine or Celexa yet, although we're pretty close. Um, Mm -hmm. But I, I, I would have to, I would be lying if I said that that doesn't scare me, but I, I am hopeful. I really, really believe that this, ends if not just gets better for everybody um i actually lately have had a lot of people reaching out to me on different um forums and such and um i I just i make sure to tell everybody you know like everybody gets better from this i just i i can't give you a timeline but it you know, I, I think that everybody believes that they are the only person that's not going to get better. And that that's just not true. I mean, I can't, I, I can't even think of one person I talked to that didn't say to me, I, I'm the worst case ever. You know what I mean? So th- there's just mm-hmm. a lot more hope than people realize, I think, but it, it's, it's hard to um, keep that alive, you know? Mm-hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Um, I think you have a really valuable perspective. But before we wrap, I wanted to ask, is there anything we didn't get around to or anything else that you wanted to share? Um, I mean, I think I got to put in most of it. Um, yeah. If anything, I just want everybody to know I'm, like I said, I'm back living at home with my husband full time. I would say that our relationship is actually closer than ever because we know what it would be like to lose each other now. Um, like, <laughs> um, 
I, you know, like I said, I'm connected with all my animals again. I'm able to do like very light exercises sometimes. Um, I can eat and drink whatever I want. I never had a big issue with that actually. Um, and I'm working again almost full time. I mean, I, I just, like I said, I just want to end it on a positive note because I used to actually like lay in my bed feeling terrible just imagining what it would be like to share my story after this and like thinking about being able to have this moment where I could say I was a little better. So, I mean, I'm not the only one that gets to have this. Like, I, I think that everybody can have their life back, honestly, even if it doesn't look exactly the same. I mean, we went through a crazy life-changing experience so it's not going to be exactly the same but it, it can be really good you know mm. well, well thanks for that and i'm going to say well if you're willing we'll do this again maybe when you're a hundred percent there or you know maybe when you're pregnant or you've got a kid or something oh like God. that because i think <laughs> it would be really exciting to, yeah. um, to have a, a a really good ending to this which i think uh, it's just r right around the corner for you. Like, like you said, you know, we're just creeping off these last couple meds and I don't think we're going to have a problem with it. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Yusuf. I really appreciate it.